premeditated murder is the most serious charge tried in our criminal courts. Now, these are facts. You can't refute facts. The kid is guilty. In the event that you find the accused guilty, the death sentence is mandatory in this case. He's 18 years old. He's still got to pay for what he did. However you decide, your verdict must be unanimous. All those voting guilty, please raise your hands. All those voting not guilty, one. What do you want? I just want to talk. Well, what's there to talk about? The knife and the way it was fought is pretty strong evidence, don't you think? All right, let's talk about Somebody it. Somebody saw the kid stab his father. What more do we need? She described the stabbing by saying she saw the boy raise his arm over his head and stab down into the father's chest. I feel need to go and form underhand. How do you know? Were you in the room when the father was killed? Yeah. This fighting. That's not why we are here. To fight, we have a responsibility. Well, what are you giving us here? This woman testified in open court! The kid said he was going to kill him, and he did kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Have you ever wondered how our criminal justice system came to be? From the methods of torture during the medieval period, transitioning to revolutionary ideas that we use today, such as due process, individual rights, and investigative procedures. It all began with the classical school of criminology, headed by a few revolutionary individuals. In essence, they proposed ideas and principles for legal and penal reform in medieval Europe. This theory came at a time where the customary punishment for someone who committed a felony was death, and various forms of torture were used. In this, what do you think the real driving force and the need for change was at the time? Do you think it was the unjustified and biased punishments, the widespread use of de the death penalty? Well, these were factors, but the main force was the use of torture. During this time period, torture was a very popular method used to obtain confessions from suspected criminals, and numerous devices were implemented to obtain the confessions. These punishments weren't used to deter the criminal from committing the crime again, but to deter the public. Can you name any individual rights you might hold as a citizen? Possibly one's right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned, the right to no such cruel and unusual punishment, or even one's right to have a trial by jury? All these rights we hold take for granted and forget how they cannot come to be. Since the times of medieval Europe, the use of capital punishment and torture has sharply declined in relation to the population at the time. This is partly due to the implementation of deterrence. Do you happen to know what kind of deterrence was used in medieval Europe? Well, if you've forgotten, torture was used not to deter the individual, criminal, but the public. This is called general deterrence. What do you think would be a good substitute for torture? Well, currently, the implementation of prisons have taken torturous place hoping to change the criminal's outlook on life and their prior offenses. Also, our criminal justice system has become much more professional in the use of classes to define crime. Would you happen to know any of the different classes we use? Well, a good example of this would be a speeding ticket. If you've ever gotten one, this is a Class C misdemeanor and results in a fine of up to $500. This is an idea of making the punishment proportionate to the crime, and has become certain and salarious. As shown, the current criminal justice system took a drastic change from cruel and unusual punishment towards a more practical means of upholding the law. But how did this change occur? It developed in the 18th century, where Enlightenment thinkers, in response to various forms of torture and punishment, developed revolutionary ideas and principles to be implemented. One of the main reasons we have the criminal justice system today is due in part to a man named Caesar Bacardi. His innovative ideas range from sexual freedom to precise measures for punishment. Bacardi is also credited in influencing Jeremy Bentham, who created a principle concerning pleasure and pain known as utilitarianism, where acts are deemed moral if they create the most happiness for the most people, and acts that create pain are immoral. Bacardi had created the a body of thought that contained four principles which helped in the understanding of the relationship between laws and crime. First, all humans possess free will. Because we make these decisions out of free will, they are viewed as according to our own rationale. If the decisions we make are according to our own rationale, we must be deeply concerned with our own personal satisfaction. If the concept of motive is linked to rationale and personal satisfaction, it is then predictable and controllable. Bakari is still known today to have influenced our founding fathers when establishing the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. 
helped influence two documents from the French Revolution, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Code of Napoleon, and principles such as punishment proportionate to the severity of the crime and a unified system of publishing laws and legal procedures. Overall, the classical school was a main contributor to the current criminal justice system we have today. It allowed for the transition to take place from the use of torture and arbitrary imprisonment to a just unified system meant to provide fairness in the law and individual rights. In this transition, Beccaria and Bentham were both essential revolutionary leaders in the classical school who helped to propel this movement and influenced a way of thinking which set the foundation and very nature of our legal system.